Creating Mercyville. So the question this morning we want to start off with is, what is Mercyville? Well, let's go right into our notes this morning. Mercyville, in your notes, is God's plan for the local church. Now, I know you're not going to find the term Mercyville in the Bible. I get that. But I believe, nonetheless, that this idea of a place of mercy, a place of love, a place of grace is what God wants us to create for the local church. Amen? A place where we can safely grow, where we can safely work on our relationship skills and not feel like somebody's going to stab us in the back. A place where we can safely work on our, uh, on our spiritual fruit, work on using our spiritual gifts without having somebody uh, you know, stab us in the back, make fun of us, gossip, slander, those sorts of things. And we see verses in the Bible that lead us to believe this is the case. Look with me, if you would, at James chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. And then jump around a little bit here, just because uh, I didn't want to put the whole entire uh, first chapter in here. Um, it starts off, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Hmm, how much favoritism do we show in the church? We give preference to people with certain spiritual gifts, people with certain ethnic backgrounds, people with money versus poor. We, we find all kinds of ways. And it says we should not do that. And moving on to verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's pretty powerful right there. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. How do you love yourself? You give yourself grace. You give yourself, uh, you believe in yourself when no one else does. You got to, or you won't move forward. You give yourself leeway when you mess up. It says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you do that, you are doing right. And jumping on to verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who is not who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What is it saying here? It's, it's, saying that, it's saying that mercy, love for people, giving them grace, rules over, over judgment. You know, a lot of times in the church, we want to we, we wanna make sure everybody's on track. That's what we're thinking in our mind. Well, I want to make sure nobody's sitting. I want to make sure everybody's going to go to heaven. You know, we live in a day and age of grace. Now, there's a difference between blatant, you know, just blatant sinning every day. We've talked about that before. There's a difference between lack of obedience and perfection. But sometimes we in the church, we just kind of go for the jugular right away when somebody messes up. How many times have you heard people mess up, fall into sin, and instead of being restored, they're completely slandered, blind, kicked out of the church, and they're left for dead? That is not God's plan. That's why the church. state of the church is like it is today. That's right. You study That's right. any church history, it's all in there. That's right. We, we basically have just, we have, uh, we don't even have the best intentions. Really, that's all driven by pride most of the time. It's pride. We want to look better than other people. We want to look like we have it together. So instead of working on ourselves, we bring everybody down. We, we point out all their mistakes and so we can look better. Now, there is a time and a place for everything, but even how we go about it is really important. Um, but let's move on to some other, uh, other scriptures here. Galatians 6, chapter, one, or, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through 3 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. This is key. It's good work. Gently and humbly. Bring them back. We Sometimes we want to just clobber them. We want to talk about them to other people instead of going to them directly. We want to you know, We want to major gossip. in the minors. We want to pick on little things in the little specks in people's eye when we got this big log hanging in our own, right? It says here, if, you, if somebody falls into sin, you are to gently and humbly. That means you don't, rawr, you know, you don't come in with, you know, guns ablazing. We like to, you know, we like to point out the story of Jesus flipping tables and stuff. But you got to realize where he was at, what the state of the situation was, you know. And we got to look at that in context. He didn't do that all the time. There you go. In fact, he looks at the adulterous woman. They were ready to stone her to death. And what did he say? 
let he who is without without sin cast the first stone. And he looked at her. He didn't say, you know what? I got you off the hook. You better not screw around again. Okay, you better clean your act up. No. He just said, go and sin. She knew what she had done wrong. She didn't need to hear a long sermon. She didn't need to be dogged. She didn't need to be put down. He just said, go and sin. And I imagine he did that in the, you know, not go and sin no more. You need it. You know, it's yeah. more, go on, sin no more. Yeah. I love you. I love you. But see, that's the way we're supposed to treat each other gently and humbly, helping each other back. And it says that, it goes on to say, and be careful that uh, you don't fall into the same temptation yourself. And it says, it goes on to say, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Share each other's burdens. What does that mean? That means not only when people fall into sin and their life is wrecked, but when things go bad, when they're in a bad mood, you know, to be with them. And it says, in this way, you obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself because you're not that important. And in Acts chapter 2, I, I, I don't know of another scripture that points this out more clearly of how we've got to give, it's it's a picture a beautiful amazing picture of the church like we had never seen it before a church who was filled freshly filled with the holy spirit and they took jesus at his word that he said give up everything you have store up treasures in heaven love each other in fact, it's your love for each other that will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And they just went for it all in. And, you know, and, I, and I've heard people say, well, they were a commune. You know, we can't do that. They weren't a commune. They lived in their own homes. They formed, in fact, if you, if most Bibles, if you look at the top, they put in these headers. They do that. You know, that's after the fact. That's not part of Scripture. But it's usually the believers form a community. That's what they did. Not a commune. But a community that's different. It's a group of people who care for each other, that will know about each other, that stand up for one another. That's what a community is. And they did it in a way that was beautiful. And I, I've, I've had this conversation probably over the last 20, 30 years with people, and some embrace it, and some just say, well, that's just not practical. Our world just isn't like that. You know, there in lies the problem. You know, we can't do that. We have too much stuff. You know, with loans and all that, we can't give people our stuff. You know, it's only as Christ leads, but yeah, we can. We just don't. You know, this was a group of people that embraced what Jesus said, and they lived. And you know what the result was? Each day, God added to the numbers. You know, we wonder why people struggle with going to church because we don't. The Bible says our love for one another will prove to the world where His. If, 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 if you think about it right now. Think about all the churches that you know about right now. This is not for public, you know, we're not going to discuss it. But I just, for internally, I want you to think. How many churches do you know that are known for their great worship? I, I know, I'm just th sitting here thinking, I, I can name off a ton. Churches that are just known for their great worship. Sometimes, uh, you know, think about churches that are known for their great leadership. I can think of several that are known for leadership. And we can go down the board and look at all these things. Big, nice facilities, all the same, but in all honesty, how many churches can you think of right now that are known by their love for one another? That their love for one another just speaks so big that just it, 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 it totally overwhelms everything else and stands out. I can't think of a church. But Jesus said, that's how they're going to know. You're my disciples. You know why we have trouble getting people in the church? Because they're seeing they're not seeing Jesus' plan. You see, we want to do a different plan. We want to say, well, I, I can do it better. You know, all we need to bring people in is great speakers and wonderful music and better bands. Let's just pay professional musicians instead of using people like myself, you know, just, you know, people that talk, self-taught. Let's get some real musicians in and they'll come. Let's get a good building, make sure it has great carpet, great facilities, great parking, all that good stuff. We'll hire the best leaders. And that's how we'll grow the church. And Jesus said, wait, I, I got a better plan. How about your love for one Make another that will prove that your mind will cause people to come to you? You see, that was his plan. We, can, we always think we have a better plan. But yet God lays it out for us. 
You know, I, I don't know about you, but I'd have had a better, a better plan in, in a lot of places. You know, but think about Gideon and his battle. Wouldn't you have come up with a better plan? Mm -hmm. I'd have come up with a better plan. You want me to go into battle with what? A pot? A torch? What? And a horn? That's not his really fighting gear. I want an M16. I want something with some firepower, baby. I'm not going in there with that. At least give me a sword or a spear or something. How about Jericho? You got another plan for that? See, I would have had a better plan for that. You know, let's get some mortar rounds going here. Let's, you know, <laughs> let's do something destructive. I mean, I, we can walk around that building all, or that uh, wall all day. It ain't going to fall down. You see, we want to come up with our own plans, but God says, I got a plan. Why don't you just love on each other and let the world see supernatural love in action, and it's going to draw them in. It's going to be amazing. And look at this account here in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met in one place and shared everything they had. Didn't say they gave away everything they had. It said they shared. You know, my weed eater is your weed eater. <laughs> my lawnmower is your. My iron is your iron. Right? They shared everything they had. <laughs> they sold property and possessions. <laughs> they sold their property and possessions and shared money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That is the most beautiful picture of a church that I have ever heard. And I, I so desire to see that here. That is the vision of the ark. That is the way I've always envisioned church. People, a, 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 an active growing, functional, biblically functional body of Christ where people truly are loving each other. And I think we can safely call that Mercy Bill. Now this is the beginning of a series. We're going to talk about these things for a few weeks, but this, this message today, I want to focus on the one another. Have you ever heard of the one another's of the Bible? Actually, I've never done a message on it. I had to do a little digging. But uh, in your notes, the one another's of God's Word, this comes from a Greek word, and that Greek word is alela. Let's try that again. Alalan. Thank you. Alalan. And that word in the Greek appears over a hundred, about a hundred times roughly, in the New Testament. And it means one another, or each other, or, or mutually, or reciprocally. It's about people working together, one another, doing something back and forth reciprocally. It occurs a hundred times, a hundred times in the New Testament. It speaks specifically to the church. So when the word, when that word, al, uh, I can't get, I can't remember, alelan, alelan, that's what it is, alelan. Once that word, I can't get it, alelan. When that word is used, it's specifically talking to the church, one another. Okay, it's not talking about us in the world. It's not talking about the world. It's talking about. Christ followers and how they relate to one another. Approximately 59 of those occurrences are specific commands teaching us, the church, how and how not to relate to one another. So we're going to learn how to relate to one another today by looking at just a few instances. I've, I've actually pulled out 20. Now several of them were mentioned several times. There's more. This is not an exhaustive list. But I pulled out 20 that we could talk about today and still get out of here a reasonable time. So here we go. Let's get into them. One and others. Here's my, here, basically, here's the premise. If we will obey, live out the one and others that are mentioned in, in the New Testament, I believe we will be well on our way to creating mercy. Amen? Yeah, good. If we can follow each of these. So let's look at them specifically. And as we go through these, I want you to evaluate yourself. I mean, face it, we can get all excited and say, yeah, we need to do this, yeah. But are we doing it? You see, remember, 
We are the church. You are the church. I want you to look at your neighbor one more time. Remind them. You are the church. There you go. You are the church. So when we say the church ought to be this way, what you have to ask yourself is, am I this way? When you say, when you say the church ought to be this or ought to do this or ought to relate in this way, what we're really saying is that I should relate this way, right? As part of the church. That's good. So I want you to evaluate yourself as we go through these 20s, and we're going to get into it. Here we go. Number one, the Bible tells us to love one another. Love one another. This is pretty obvious. We talk about this a lot. But here's the thing. You know, people ask me, and I've been asked this, I mean, literally for 20, 30 years. Why do you always bring up these same things? Here's what I always respond. You know what? When everyone's doing it, I'll stop talking about it. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> they teach you, in, if you go to seminary, they teach you that one of the most important things you can, real, uh, you can do is learn creative redundancy. Because people don't always get it the first time. We have to hear it over and over again. So love one another. Are we loving one another? The Bible says in John chapter 13, verse 34, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Shouldn't we just stop in our tracks right there? That we are being given a new commandment by Jesus Christ. I, I think that should cause us to stop and say, hmm, the new commandment, eh? Boy, this is, must be pretty important. And here's what he says. Love each other. Love each other. Now, he doesn't just stop there. He tells us how to do it. Because we wouldn't know what that means. Love each other. You mean just have a warm fuzzy quiver in my liver? You know, is that what I want? You know, just little butt flies in my stomach? That's not what he was talking about. <laughs> and he defines what he's talking about. He says, he goes on to say, love each other just as I have loved you. You should love one another. Now, how did Jesus love us? He laid down his life. And he said that more than one time. This was not a, an isolated incident. In fact, this particular command uh, with the word alelon, alelon you get it wrong, appears 11 times in the New Testament. 11 times. It's like Jesus, it's like the Bible is saying, look, this is so important and I know you aren't going to get it the first time, so I'm going to use creative redundancy and I'm going to say it again and again because I want to make sure you get it. And that's what he says. He says, love each other. Now, how did Jesus love us? He laid his life down for us. You say, well, I, I don't want to give up my life. That's exact. Every time we serve somebody and we invest our time and energy and money, we are giving up a portion of our life for them. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying. Yeah, we might not jump out of a bus, in front of a bus to save somebody's life. We might not be crucified on the cross to save others. But we can lay our life down an hour or two or three at a time. You know, last night, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, it could have been just Christine and I here setting up. But a couple of, in fact, one who wasn't even feeling good, had a sinus infection and laryngitis, came out feeling, you could tell he didn't look right, you know, but he came out. <laughs> 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 You know, you don't go up to people, especially ladies, you don't go up and say, man, you look sick, you know? But he did. And other people came out when they had other things already pre-planned, and they, they dropped what they were doing, and they gave up a little bit of their life. They were here from 5 to what, 8.30, I think it was? 4.30. Oh, yeah, yeah, we actually started at 4. Yeah, we actually picked up the trail at 4. And we were gone until 8.30, which is not the norm, but, you know, we had to mount TVs and whatnot, you know, so it was a pretty rough week. <laughs> and they came out and they gave their life just a little bit to serve. And that's exactly what Jesus said. He said, you want to, he's saying, if you want to love each other, you can't just do it with a feeling. You can't just do it with words. You've got to invest. Yeah. Lay down your life for others. Are you laying your life? When's the last time you laid down your life? And remember, this is one another. So look around this room. When's the last time you laid your life down for somebody in this room? If you can't say, if you can't think of a time, you're probably not quite there yet. You want to look at that. Because we are to love one another. 
number two. We know about that one, so we're going to move on. But it is the most important. Everything else falls under this, right? Jesus said, love God, love others. All of the demands of the prophets, all the laws, everything in Scripture basically falls under this umbrella. Love one another, love God. So we know those things are important. And I would say all these fall underneath. Love one another. That's why I had it first. Number two, honor one another. We are told to honor one another. And I'm not, I, I'm not making you, know, there's several verses that point these things out. I'm just giving you one for each, okay? Keep it simple. That way our outlines didn't get so huge that I had to do two programs. <laughs> so honor one another. We see this in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. It says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. That's good. No, we don't, we don't do this very often. Just honoring somebody is lifting them up. It's, it's giving them recognition. Honoring them as being special. You know, we ought to make each other feel special. Do we do that? We don't like to honor other people. We like to honor ourselves. You know, here's how I'm working for the Lord. Here's what's going on in my life, what's going on in my ministry. The, you know, me, 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 me. You know, I think about that little Jim Gaffigan skit where he talks about, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna work on myself while I read Self <laughs> magazine while I think about myself, <laughs> you know, and then he does it myself. You know, that's kind of the way I feel like we all are running around. You know, me, look at me. And God says, why don't you honor each other? You say, well, that person sins, so do you. This person makes mistakes, so do you. This person's ugly. So are you. Yeah. Somebody. <laughs> I don't like the way this person's dresses. They don't like the way you dress. Okay? This is good. We've got to overlook this little stuff and honor people for who they are. You are made in the likeness of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Every person in here, you, for you are marked as a creation of God. And if you are a Christ follower, you are the church. You are literally filled with God's Holy Spirit. I must, I have no choice but to honor you. But yet we don't. We need to learn to honor people. Lift them up. Make them feel special. Talk about them as if they're more important than us. That's how a church creates mercy. Let's move on. Number three. <laughs> Number three, we need to live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony. Now, what, is har what does that mean? Well, let's look at the scripture first. The scripture says in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, May God, who gives this, pati uh, I'm sorry, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ. So he's saying that this, this kind of behavior is fitting for those who follow Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to live in harmony? One mind, one accord. Yes. Two with each other. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. So when we sing, you know, can we sing a harmony? Okay, so what do we sing? Uh, uh, let's see, what's a song that we sang when we did a harmony today? Okay, I'll come to the altar. Who sings harmony on that? You sing harmony? Okay. So, sing with me. So, ready? Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Okay. Now, what is that? What is singing in harmony? Singing in harmony. Basically. No, this is important now. I know it's funny. When we sing, I know it's goofy. But here's the point I'm trying to make. I just had to let it die. You see what I'm Here's the thing. When you're singing in harmony, you are singing two different parts. Okay? We are different people. We have different spiritual gifts. We have different <laughs> ways of looking at the world. We have different points of view. We're not the same. Okay? Some of us have beards. Some of us don't. Some are men. Some are women. Some are black. Some are white. Some are some shades in between. Okay? We're all different but when we work together in a way that, that is constructive, in a way that we function as one body, everybody doing their part, 
that is in harmony. You see, in a, in a, in a vocal, in a, in a, in a vocal situation, a person singing a harmony is not singing the lead, is not singing the melody. They're singing another part. And you can have several parts. You can have eight notes, you can have six notes, you know, all this stuff. But when, if somebody's singing not in a note that, that works well, then it sounds awful. Okay? I'd ask people to do that, but we never can. It's like they try to sing off and they keep singing the right part. So I won't ask them to, to demonstrate that. But it's, you've heard a person singing off and it's like, the other, you know, and it just doesn't sound right. It's practice, though. You practice. Right, exactly. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. There you go. Now, we're only t we're, this is just an example, so nobody get, like, you know, nobody get all fired up like I'm, I'm attacking you singing. I call it. But here's the thing. When people are singing in harmony, right. when they're singing notes that work with other notes, it sounds beautiful. Yeah. Together, we can have different opinions. We can have different ways of approaching things. We can have, obviously, different spiritual gifts. We want to. The Holy Spirit gives us different spiritual gifts so that we will complete the entire picture. Yes. Otherwise, we just have a puzzle of one piece, and it looks, you know, what is that? You know, it looks like a rock. What is that? You know, well, you put it all together, you realize it's a forest. Okay. You know, with beautiful animals in it. Okay, but you don't know that if you don't have all the pieces. And so God says, work in such a way that you that you work in a in a collaborative way. That you work in a way that fits with everybody else. And in harmony, do beautiful, amazing, wonderful things. In fact, more correctly said, let the Holy Spirit do amazing, beautiful, wonderful things through you as a group. But what, is it, what does it take? And he said it earlier. He said you can practice this. You see, sometimes it doesn't come natural because our, our, our flesh wants to do our own thing. Our flesh wants to do something completely different. But with practice and with prayer and persistence, we can learn to work in harmony with one another. But it means cooperation. Cooperation. It means stretching. It means learning to change, let God change who we are by changing the way we think. Okay? Not becoming somebody else. It's, you're not in harmony. If everybody sings melody, it sounds just like, you know, it sounds boring. But when everybody's doing their part together, it sounds beautiful. Yes. But we've got to be together together. So we need to be in harmony with one another. Number four, build up one another. This is very important, too. The Bible says over and over that the reason he gives us spiritual gifts is to build up the church. That is not just in numbers. Yes, we want to grow in numbers. And people say, oh, you just want a big church. No, I don't want a big church. I want a big bunch of people in heaven. Amen? I mean, that's what it's all about. There are lost people out there, and as long as there are lost people, we have to try to grow. We have to try to reach out into these communities. We have to try to reach out with the good news of Jesus Christ and grow the church. But that's not all building up the church means. We need to build up the church in strength. We need to build each other up in strength. We need to pour into one another and help each other to grow and become as strong and as firm, firmly planted on the solid rock of Christ as they can be. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 19, So then let us aim for harmony in the church and build each other up. You see, it's in, this, it's in the context of working together in harmony that we build each other up. And that was the last one. That was the and last we went one. To this one. That's right. That. This is good. That's right. It's in the context of working together in harmony that we can build each other up. Because we're building each other up using our spiritual gifts. If my gift is encouragement and I encourage you, it builds you up. If my gift is teaching and I teach you from the word, you grow. If my gift is leading people into the place of worship, when you do that, then you grow. And then it's also just using my words to build, each, to build you up. And you using your words to build each other up. And you using your actions to build each other up. Whenever we act in love towards people, that means we lay down our life and help them and serve them. We are going to build them up. So this means a lot of different things. It's very good. But we need to build up one another. Do we, do we aim? This is the aim. It says, let's, let's read this again. 
let us aim for harmony. That means there's that means I got to work at it. It isn't just something that comes easy. If I if I brought in a, a dartboard, you know, and we all like you know threw it across the room, okay? Some of you probably are really good and you hit the bullseye every time because you've been practicing. Some of you, some of you would really probably. No, she never misses. So, we'll be talking about pride here, but no, I'm just kidding. I'm, just kidding. Well, then, you know, I'm teasing. The joke is I can't see. I agree. Yeah. Yes, I get it. I get it. She uses the force, though, and so it works. Yes. Yes. I knew I liked you. The force is strong. So a lot of you stink, though, and you're gonna like you're gonna throw it. And you're gonna hit the wall. You're not even gonna hit the board. And you're going you're gonna to work at it. You're going to practice, right? And as you practice, you're going to get closer and closer. You're going to learn how to throw it. And you're going to eventually get some bullseye. That's what he's saying here. He's saying you've got to work at this. Aim, aim for harmony in the church. That means we might not be there, but we all got to be aiming at it. We've got to be focusing, trying to, to achieve harmony. And then in that context, let's aim to build each other up. So that when we leave here, we're stronger. So that when we leave each other's company at any time during the week, we are stronger and ready to take on whatever the enemy throws at us, whatever the world throws at us. Number five. It's not just living in, living in harmony. This is, a, this is a tough one. But number five, we need to be like-minded towards one another. Now, this one throws most of us because we don't get this. And I'm going to explain what this means here in just a minute. Let's read the scripture in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. It says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy, oh, here we go, by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together, oh my goodness, what is he saying here? With one mind and purpose. Amen. Now how on this earth can we be like one? Face it, you and I are never, and I can pick anyone, you and I are not going to agree on everything in the world. Alright? We're not. We're different. We're different people. We've come from different backgrounds. We're at a different place in our spiritual growth. How can we're never going to agree? In fact, husbands and wives, do you agree with each other all the time? Never. <laughs> Somebody who's willing to be honest. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes we we find it very difficult to even get along, or even to agree and be like-minded with our spouse when it comes to child rearing, how to take care of the home, how to get things done, whatever. Okay. So in that. Context, how in the world can we do? It seems like Paul is asking for something that isn't possible, supernatural. That's true. But I believe it is possible. Number one, because we've got all things are possible, because it is supernatural. And I agree with that. In fact, the love, in fact, I didn't say that earlier. The love that we show for one another is not supposed to be the kind of love the world shows, right? It is a supernatural love that is born of the Holy Spirit. Right? And you know what? So is this. Every one of these are spirit-driven. We've got to remember that. Okay? So we're not going to be able to do this without having the Holy Spirit. It's going to be very, very difficult. But how can we be like-minded? Notice it says towards one another. How can we be, how can we agree wholeheartedly, live with one another, and work together with one mind and purpose? I believe there's only one way we can do that. And that is we have to have, we have to have total agreement on the essentials. And on the non-essentials, we have to have grace. Okay? We aren't going to agree on all the little things, you know? In fact, there's been a discussion going around the church about, you know, whether we should, uh, you know, and whether we should recognize holidays. Okay? You know what? That is a great example of a non-essential. And yet we want to major in this as a church. You know, this is, hey, here's something where we can disagree with people. You know what? It's, a non, it's not an essential. In fact, the Bible says that, you know, don't let these things get in your in your path. It, it's an eating meat that's been uh, sacrificed to idols kind of a thing, right? I mean, some people really had a problem with that. You know, this meat has been sacrificed to a foreign god. And others just said, look, man, this is food. It's meat. 
And so Paul said, you know what? Y'all just got to get along in this area. Don't cause each other to stumble. If you think that eating meat is wrong, eating this meat is wrong, don't do it. Don't defy your conscience. If you like, if you think it's fine and your conscience is clear, eat it. Because you know that everything can be done to the glory of God. But let's not beat each other up on it. Let's not cause each other to stumble on this particular issue. Okay? Because there are a lot bigger fish to fry. I don't think we're ever going to, I don't think we're going to get to heaven and two people get to heaven and one says, well, I was very careful not to, you know, not to, uh, not to uh, follow or go along with any, you know, um, of our American traditional holidays, even the ones that focus on you, Lord. I just totally did away with them. Uh, you know, I, I didn't make any disciples or anything, but I did that. Right. And the other person standing there, well... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I gave some Christmas gifts out. I gave my wife chocolate on, on Valentine's Day. But I, I did, but I did make disciples, and I made that the focus. Now, who is, who is the Lord going to be more happy with? Okay? You know what I'm saying? Yes. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, there's some things that are pretty important. Okay? And I'm not, dis, I'm not discounting any of that. Okay? But there are several things that we can disagree with. I've seen them for 20 years. Dan, should you dance? Big issue. Should you play cards? I even had a church that, that had a big problem with drums in the church. We, it's funny, we don't have any here today, but not because of that. But my uh, a pastor came in and took over a church, and he said, well, drums were used to worship Satan, you know, in Africa, whatever, and so therefore we are not going to have it in the church. And I'm like, you know, okay, I think that's, I think we could safely say that's a non-essential. Did but what they are use the Old Testament though? Going into battle, didn't they use drums? Yeah, they did. I, okay. that, yeah, I, I, obviously, we do not take that stance. The reason we don't have drums is because our drummer is working today. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing. There are a lot of little issues that we could go. But we've got to. We've got to. If we're going to be like-minded, we've got to agree with the big things. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Right? Jesus died on the cross and paid for our sins. We, uh, we, are, uh, we become followers of Christ. We become filled with the Holy Spirit based on following the law or, or believing in Christ. Believing in Christ, right? As long as we have those core beliefs together, we can learn to have grace with, you, with each other on the little things. We might not agree. You might say, well, you know, I just don't, I don't think it's good to, I don't know, pick whatever. Okay, here's another comfort. Drinking. That's a controversial. The Bible doesn't necessarily teach we shouldn't drink alcohol. It teaches against uh, alcohol. Or, well, it teaches against drunk drinks. Okay? So some of you might say, well, I don't have a problem having a drink now and again. I just don't believe in drunkenness. Some of you might be like, man, I just think anybody who does that, that's you. you're just pushing it right there. All right, you know what? I, we, we can definitely see in the Word of God that no one is going to hell specifically by drinking every once in a while uh, a drink of alcohol. Okay, getting drunk, all those kind of things leading to debauchery, yeah, that's going to get you in trouble. But drink, you know, and so what we've got to do is we've got to say, yeah, I know he does that once in a while, or she doesn't, but I'm going to have grace. I'm going to have grace. Now, if I see them stumbling drunk down the road, throwing up, you know, <laughs> out of their car or whatever, maybe we'll have a conversation, okay? <laughs> all right? Or I don't believe in, I don't think dancing is good, okay? So we, you know, I know they like to go out dancing. This was a big issue back in, you know, first church I started, there was a group of people who just loved dancing and a group of people who thought it was the evil thing in the world, and we learned to have <laughs> grace with each other. Now, we'd allow each other, you know, hey, but you know what, if I see somebody out there groping somebody who isn't their wife, okay, you know what, I'm going to, then maybe I'm going to, maybe I'm going to stop and have a conversation. So you see how we can have grace in the small things, in the non-essentials, but we can focus, we can have total like-mindedness, right? Like, sister, you know, brother, I don't necessarily agree with everything that you agree with. You don't agree, but you know what? You are my brother. You are my sister, and we are family. Yes. Who's saying that song? We are family. <laughs> Thank you for finishing what I couldn't do it. Who was that? Yes. I will go with that. I don't yes. know. All right. Good job. Excellent. Victoria Hannah, everybody. You're the greatest tribute. Right? You're 70 years old. Anyway, we are family, and that's, we can still be like-minded, even though we disagree on a few things. Does that make sense? Yeah. We can go with one mind and purpose. Why? Because we have a vision. We have a vision. What is our vision? 
to reach people for Jesus, to use our spiritual gifts, to, to be like-minded. That's our vision. Together, we can be of one mind, doing the task that God has called us. Number six, we need to accept one another. Accept one another. What does that mean? Well, listen to the scripture first. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be uh, given glory. Now, what does accept mean? It means that no matter what your background, it doesn't mean, it, it means no matter what your sinful life has been in the past, no matter what your color, no matter what your, you know, your particular likes and dislikes are, I can accept who you are. I might not accept your sin, which we are not supposed to accept, but I am to accept you. Jesus accepts us just like we are. Christianity is a come-as-you-are religion. He doesn't say, go get cleaned up, go fix yourself, get everything right, then come to me and worship. That's not the way it works. He says, I have grace. My sin, or my, my, my sacrifice, rather, has covered your sins. And I see you as white if you'll accept me. Okay? Just, just believe in me and accept, accept my gift of salvation. And I will see you as white. And you come just as you are. And we'll work on those little things. That, those, that's called sanctification. I'm going to teach you what's right and what's wrong. But just come right now. You know what? You came out of adultery. I don't care. I love you. You came out, you were a prostitute. I love you. I love you. You were a gang leader. You have tattoos up and down your body. Piercings everywhere. I love all of us. You're fat. You're skinny. You're ugly. You're man. You're woman. You're black. You're white. You're purple. I love you. We need to accept everybody just the way they are. Now, when there's when sin comes up, we don't have to accept the sin, but we can love them through the sin. Amen. Amen. You know, we as a church have done a horrible job of this. And this is why we have such a tr such trouble reaching people. Instead of going out and showing people, you know what, there's a better way. I know you're pregnant you don't want to have this baby, but let us love you. Let us help you. Let us, let us just love on you and this baby and bring you into the world and give you a way to make this happen. Money, place to stay, whatever. But no, instead we, hang, we stand outside abortion clinics, clinics calling people murderers. I'm not sure that's the right way. We instead of instead of teaching homosexuals about Jesus first, we attack their sin. Why would you listen to that? You have these homosexuals haven't even signed up to follow the Lord yet. Why would they abide by his laws? There we go. Right? Like so we share Makes Jesus sense. with them first and we love on them. Uh -huh. You know what? Here's my experience with homosexuals. I we have uh, in our past we have allowed several allowed. That's even a terrible thing to say. So I <laughs> we have accepted right. homosexual couples, and they have come into our church. We have offered absolutely no condemnation. We love them. We hug on them. We give our lives to them. We pour into them. And I have never one time in my life, a ministry life, have I ever had to go and say, do you realize your way of living is wrong? In every single case, bar none, with just the love and the fellowship and the grace and the teaching, and I've never done a message on homosexuality. In fact, usually when they're there, I'm a little bit more sensitive, and I won't even use it as an example. Every, in every case, at least one of the partners has come to me and said, I know there's something wrong in my life, and I know God will do the business with them. The Holy Spirit will do the work. We need to love on them and accept them where they are. We start throwing rocks, and guess what? They don't come to church. They don't hear. They don't experience the Holy Spirit, and they run away. We've got, and you know what? I'm talking about extreme sin. How much more should we accept each other? Yes. No matter what we look like, smell like, dress like. Great. Jesus died for all of us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <coughs> Number seven, serve one another. Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Wow, that's, a, that's even a strange way to say that, isn't it? Wow. Let's read that again. You, brothers and sisters, are called to be free. So he's talking in the context of freedom from the law. 
freedom from sin. But do not use your freedom within this context of grace. Do not indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly. Now, how would we? How can indulging oneself's flesh be kind of the opposite of serving one another? Well, guess what? The flesh likes to do what it wants to do, right? Yeah. And service takes sacrifice. We like to be pleasured. You know, we. In fact, my wife and I, we were going to. We had a. a, a actually, it was one. The one time, like in the last couple months, that we actually had a Saturday night to ourselves. Normally there's kids there, normally there's something going on, and we had a date planned last night. And guess what? We didn't get to do that. Because we're here to And who knows when that time will come to kid. You know, the flesh wanted to do what, what pleased us. We wanted to go have fun. But we chose to lay our lives down as living sacrifices and do what was necessary. You see, that's how it's different. Okay? The flesh wants to do what it wants to do. It wants to pleasure itself. It wants to partake in, you know, just not necessarily evil things, just things that make us happy. Sitting and watching a television show, playing a video game, reading a good book, um, you know, even just taking a nap. Certainly nothing evil about that. Naps and books. But it says here, don't don't use your freedom to indulge in the indulge the flesh. And indulging the flesh. Is, does not necessarily equate to sin, right? We I mean, sometimes we indulge the flesh. Last night we did eat a pizza. We left here, we realized we had nothing for dinner, so we're like, you know, what are we doing? So we, we had to go over and drop off the trailer uh, at our old place, which is right next to Carson. I said, why don't we just order a pizza? You know what? It was really good. <laughs> and I ate some. I didn't overeat, but I indulged the flesh. It tasted really good, okay? That's not sin, okay? But he's saying, don't just indulge the flesh with your freedom. Instead, use this freedom to serve one another humbly in love. In other words, sacrifice yourself. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your energy. Be there for other people. All right? Last night, somebody had asked uh, my daughter to pick up someone this morning for church. And she's like, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. But man, we got to be here early. And so another member of the church just said, hey, look, you know, I don't have to be there early. I'll go drive out of my way half hour or 20 minutes or whatever and go get this person. That is what it means to lay ourselves down for one another. That's what it means to serve one another. And I want you to rate yourself in that. How do you do? Who's, when's the last time you served someone in this group? That's how we become merciful. Number eight, forgive one another. Forgive one another. Obviously, the Bible says that we need to be forgiving. In fact, Jesus is so hot on this topic, he says, if you don't forgive others, my Father will not forgive you. So this is a pretty important thing. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, he says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Very simple. It's pretty simple. But yet, yet it's simple. But yet we don't do it. I, you know, and you know, I know it. You know, I know we don't do it because uh, people tell me I can forgive, but I won't forget. Now, notice that it's not that they can't forget; it's that they won't forget. All right, but yet if we look at First Corinthians chapter thirteen, it says, "Love keeps no record." Of all. No record. We don't write it down. We don't try to remember it. Yeah, I mean, okay, I get it. Our brains are kind of like we're stuck with them. And once something comes in our memory, we, it's not like I can just, you know, I, I don't have one of them flashy things from the right. men in black where I can, you know, and I don't know it anymore. So that means I got to choose, I got to take captive every thought, right? And when I start to think about what you did to me, instead of replaying the tape, I got to say no. I take captive that thought and I give control to Christ and I choose to think about something else because I have given you. That's what we need to do. And I hear it coming up over and over again. This person did that. This person did that. This person did that. You know what? we got to cut that out. Yeah. If we're going to create mercy, but we have got to learn to erase the record. We, we sh our lives should be like etch-a-sketches. You remember those? 
you do when you're a kid, you draw a little picture and it come out really awful because you get, you know, it's all about coordination, up, down, left, right. Yeah. And you get this little house made or whatever, and you're like, ah, this really stinks and I want to try it again. What do you do? Flip it up and you know what? That's what forgiveness does. And here's the thing, we're supposed to love each other. And what does the Bible say love does? It covers a multitude of sins. Exactly. You know what? When we love each other, according to Corinthians, we erase. We keep no record. We take that edge of schedule. And we need to start doing that more often. What? Robert, what did you do to me? I forgot. Mel, what in the world? I can't believe you just... I forgive that. Right? That's the way we need to live Forgiving one another. And that means, does that mean that what they did wasn't wrong? No. Are we saying that it wasn't a, a valid concern? No. Are we saying that, you know, there shouldn't be any changes? No, I'm not saying that at all. You know, if, uh, you know, if, if Robert has a passion or has a passion for boxing and he goes around punching people all the time, he gets <laughs> okay, I can forgive him. <laughs> And I'm using Robert because he's like the most loving person that I know, and so like no one can see him doing this, so you know I'm making it up. But he's like, you know, if you wonder I'm doing that, okay, I, yeah, I can forgive him for punching me and give me a bloody lip. But if I see him doing it again, you know, hey, maybe we should talk about this. But I do what? How do I go to him? Humbly and gently. And careful not to fall into the same thing when he ticks me off. <laughs> We're talking and you don't want to listen, right? Humbly and gently. <laughs> and let go. Please, oh, do, please, please. Yeah, now let's scratch that from the record right there. No, no. No, humbly and gently. No, we humbly and gently go to them. And we, we, we say, hey, you know, is this really the right way to handle arguments, disagreements? You know, is this the way you want to go down? You know, in history, is this the, way, the kind of attitude that Christ would have? You know, and we go down that path together. But we need to forgive. Etch a sketch. And next time somebody offends you, just think of the etch a sketch. Okay? And let's move. We got two more. We can do those. We got two more to get through today. Number nine, be patient with one another. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. You see how a lot of, a lot of these work together? Yeah. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Think of bearing with one another. What does that mean? That means you're doing something that's rubbing me the wrong way. Yeah. Right? Now, I can guarantee you if we hang out long enough, I'm going to rub you the wrong way. And I guarantee you, if we hang out with uh, long enough, you're going to rub me the wrong way. And the same is going to happen with each other. But you know what the Bible says? Bear with one another. Be patient. We don't want to be patient. You know, we look at people and we say, okay, I see there's, there's, there's mistakes. They're not acting right. They're not, they're, they're not, their sanctification is just too darn slow. And so we got to go in there and, you know, and we want to attack. The Bible says be patient because guess what? He's being patient with you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He's being very patient with you. Letting you come. I mean, I have been a Christian. I've been a Christ follower. I don't know when it, the, the first... I, I'll be honest. I'm not 100% sure when the Holy Spirit came into my life the first time. I know when He really made Himself like obvious to me. Uh, and that was in the military. That's when I, when I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was Holy Spirit filled and everything was cool. It might have been earlier than that. I certainly was aiming for it before that. Okay, But in all these years, studying the Word. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in the Bible, obviously, just to prepare messages. And you know what? I'm still growing, people. I don't know everything. I still don't act the way I should. I get irritated when things don't go right. You know, I... I, I, I sometimes lack the patience that I that I need. I have them with certain people, like I work with autistic kids. And I get that patience galore with them, and then y'all do something, and I get irritated. You know, I mean, I, God's still working on me, but He loves me. He's patient with me, and He's doing. Th he's working in me as I can accept it. You know, we need to exercise the same patience with each other. As I was hearing the story of the, the gentleman back there that shared earlier, you know, it's really about grace and. and 
you know, with our kids, when they mess up, sometimes we just have to be patient because they're learning too. And we want them to, you know, we want it to be done now and we just have to be patient. So what does it tell us? It says be patient with one another. Humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another. How? In love. Because love is what binds us all together. Love says, you know what, I don't care that you're not where I think you are. You are my brother in Christ. You are my sister in Christ. And we are family. Amen. And I'm going to love you regardless of, yes. of what yes. you look like and what you do and, and you know, whatever. We're going to hang in there. You know, that's why I honestly believe the worst thing that we can do is become, you know, kind of part of the current society's church shopper kind of thing. You know, church shopper, church hopper, you know, just going from church to church. You know, whenever they, we get mad, we just kind of move someplace else. Whenever we get irritated, whenever we don't like something. You know what? I want, to, I want a group of people that says, you know what? You're a moron a lot of times, but I'm going to hang in here with you. Yeah. You're just stupid sometimes, and you're just, and you're just you are ridiculous a lot. But I love you, and you are my brother, and we're, we're going to work this out. That's right. And we're going to stick together until Jesus comes back or one of us dies. You know what? If we can do it in marriage, why can't we do it in a group? You know, my wife and I don't always get along. We don't see eye to eye. Some of you all said you didn't get along ever. You don't ever see eye to eye. But you know what? You're still married. Right? You're still married. And guess what? If you can do it in a marriage... You can do it in the church. Amen. Right? So the, the problem's the same. The, the, the thing that causes divorce is the same thing that causes people to split up in the church. Yeah. Well, there's a wedding feast coming, too. You know, we're supposed to prepare and adore ourselves for, for the groom. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it is happening. That's right. right. All these good things that you're telling us, we're preparing to do that for, for there's another marriage coming. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're the bride. Amen. Absolutely. So be patient. And we're going to end here on this one. Kind of funny that we're ending on this one because this is the one we probably struggle with the most. And we're going to hit another 10 next week. And who knows, we might hit another 10 after that. I, I only can fit 20 into this particular. Uh, but there's, there's more. There are more. There's a drum. But we're going to end on this one. Submit to one another. Submit to one another. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Now, I want, you, I want to focus on this for just a second. When we read the Word of God, we have to understand that those little headings that were put in, those were put in afterwards, and somebody said, okay, I think these things go together. I think these... But a lot of times, they, they do fed up. They do fed up. In fact, if we read this verse, in fact, can somebody... I don't have my... Actually, I don't have my phone handy. Can somebody look up Ephesians chapter 5 for me? In verse 21, and just let me borrow their Bible, uh, preferably like NLT or something I can read. I, I'm too simple-minded to, you know, aim for the King James. Yeah, the American Standard. It blows my mind. 521. 520, yeah, 521. Yeah. May I borrow? All right. Seems like we've done this recently. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, let's look at the context. Okay, so it starts, if you see here, with verse 21, it starts with spirit-guided relationships, wives and husbands. And it starts, and further... How do you start a new thought with and further? <laughs> right? This is a completion of another thought. So let's go back and read so that we get the context. He's saying, be careful how you live. Don't act like fools, but those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil, evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So he, he starts by saying, I want you to do, to focus on what I want for you. And then he goes into another thought here. Don't, uh, sorry, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it's all one breath here. He says, be filled with the Spirit, singing songs, psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs among yourself. This is relation. He sings, he sings, Pour into each other with your attitude. You have a singing spiritual hymn on your lips. And as you connect with one another, let that be the, the aura the, you know, in the room. That Let that be the atmosphere in which you, you connect. He says, and make music to the Lord in your hearts. 
So he's saying, be filled with the Spirit. We don't know what comes first. This, If you go back to the Greek, you can't tell. There's no direction there. Be filled with the Spirit, sing psalms, or sing psalms and be filled with the Spirit. We don't really know the direction, but we do know they go together. There's a correlation there. So, he says, sing psalms and hymns uh, to each other. Make music in your heart to the Lord and give thanks for, uh, for everything always. God the Father. Always. Absolutely. Give thanks. And give thanks if for everything. To God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I do not believe he is talking about husbands and wives here. He is talking to the church, one another. Okay, He's saying relate to each other spiritually by pouring a positive you know, atmosphere, by singing psalms and hymns. All the while making music in your heart, because that's the only way you can sing it, is if you're making it in your heart. Be thankful, because that's the only way we're going to be positive enough. And then submit to one another. Now, what does that mean, to submit to one another? Does that mean I do everything you say? Does that mean you have to do everything I say? Is this some sort of dictatorship here? How do we submit to one another? That means we humble ourselves and we listen, we pay attention. We don't disregard one another. Okay? In, in a marriage, we can be mutually submissive. You know, she doesn't have to do everything I say, and I don't have to do everything she says. But what we do need to do is stop and listen to one another so that we can figure out the best way to go. Right? And so in, in the church, a lot of times, we don't want to be submissive. We want to, we like to get our input from other sources. Right? You know, from you know, other pastors, other books, you know, other people, the radio, YouTube, whatever. We try to get that input because these people, we can we don't have to, we don't have to be humble. You know, they don't know us. We just listen, we get all this, and then we want to come in and show off our knowledge. And we want to tell people how to live. We want to tell people how to live. And there's there's certainly some value. And, and there will be a time that you need to teach, but you know what? We also need to submit to one another. So when somebody does try to teach, you need to listen. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything, but you need to submit and listen to them. That means if you're, you know, if you're, if they're a leader in a church in a ministry, submit to their leadership. If they're, you know, if they're in a position of authority, submit to that authority. Now, if your pastors and your leaders are dictators and they're leading you to do the wrong thing, then you're in the wrong church. Okay, that's a problem. But then, even if that happens, what do we do? What's the biblical thing to do? Go to them one-on-one on one. On one first, not to the church. Hey, did you hear what Pastor Rick was doing? No. Go to Pastor Rick or whoever it is first, one-on-one. On one. If you can't if you can't work it out, go take somebody else, two or three, bring them to Pastor Rick, and let's talk about it as a group. Okay? Then if you don't get what you need, if you still feel like you're not being heard, then you go to the church. Typically, that would mean go to the elders. You know, you can pull, however you can pull people together. But get the body together and say, hey, here's an issue. I want to work this out. I love this pastor. He loves me. I want to work it out, but I still see that we have an issue here. And you try to work it out. Now, once all those happen, the Bible doesn't say that's going to guarantee success. But I guarantee you one thing. It's going to bring you a lot closer to God's and backstabbing and slamming, okay? So you go through all those steps, and if you still can't get resolution, then maybe it's time. Now the whole church has heard you, and they're not siding with you. Either A, you're wrong, which could be the case, and you might have to just submit to God. Number two, your church is out of whack, and maybe it is time to work for someplace else to worship. Okay? okay? But you want to go through the steps first, Okay? Submit to one another just simply means to take that humble stance and to listen, to hear them out, to, to, to be interested in what's important to them, to focus on what's important to them once in a while, okay? And to allow yourself to be led and taught by others. Because you know what? If I think I can't be taught by any of you, I'm in no place to lead anybody, Right? If I can't be taught, then I can't teach. I think that's extremely important. If you're not teachable, you are not a teacher. Because teachers are teachable. And they have to be because we are mere humans, and our leader is not a pastor, but a 
Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. I will never be the head of this church or any church. That, my friend, is reserved for Jesus Christ. And we all must be submissive to him. So I want to go back through these lists of ten. And I want you to just close your eyes as I do this. We're looking at the alawans, <laughs> the one and others of the New Testament. And I want you to just, as I read through this list, I just want you to think, consider, where, where am I with this particular thing? Number one, love one another. Love one another. To honor one another. Lift each other up. Treat each other as special. Three, live in harmony with one another. We're going to do our own thing, but we want to do it in a way that's interlinked and harmonizing what others are doing. Build up one another. How do you do in that area? When you leave a meeting, do people feel better about themselves or worse, so to say? Do you use your gifts to build people up and build the church up, or do you, do you tear it down so that it will look better? Number five, like-minded. Do you tend to nitpick on all the little things that, that are non-essentials and try to cause division? Or do you have grace in those areas, which we know Jesus has, and focus on the main things so that we can go and work like-minded with one purpose, with one heart? Number six, accept them. Do you accept everybody in this room? And that even those in the body of Christ who who are completely different than you. You accept them as they are. Or those who are still struggling with sin, can you accept them and love on them until the point where they can be sanctified and be where they need to be? Serve one another, the Bible says. Do you lay yourself down as a living sacrifice, laying out and, and using your time, laying it down for the benefit of others in your church? Number eight, forgive one another. Do you forgive people when they mess up? Immediately, just let it go. Do you erase it like the edge of schedule? You're just getting rid of it? Or do you tend to hang on to it and revisit it over and over and over? Number nine, patience. Do you, do you exercise patience with, with each other? Through the Spirit. Letting people be sanctified at their pace. And when you do have to go to them, you're patient and gentle, and you submit to one another out of love for God. Submitting because of your love, listening to them, hearing them out, letting them use their gifts, letting them teach, knowing that we can learn from them. These are ten things that I believe, and we're going to go through ten more next week, I believe if we will do these things, if we will live these out on a regular basis, we will create mercy but We will create a place that is beautiful. We will create a place that is friendly and kind and loving, where people feel supported, where people feel like they can come in and they can just be themselves, where they can work on who they are, not worry about what they look like and take care of some kind of veneer coating so that no one will pick on them. <laughs> I, I, I really believe that this may be one of the most important messages I've given in a while. And I believe this series might be one of the most important series that I've ever done. It's very good. Why? Because we are living in a relationally broken society that does not know how to love each other. We are supposed to teach it with supernatural love. This morning, wherever you are, wherever you're sitting right now, I want you to just, just think about where you're at in each of these areas. What do you need to work on? Where is it that you need to, to surrender to God in this area so that we can see mercy will be created here at the ark? Whatever God is speaking to you about, whatever we've spoken to you about as we've gone through this message, I want you to just take a moment to do business with God. You can do it there where you sit. You can come forward to the altar. You, you can go to the back. You can go outside. Whatever it is, just don't miss the opportunity to say, I do. Yes, because otherwise, we're, our meeting today was for nothing. Let's let this meeting, this time that we spend in God's presence, let's, let's let it catapult us into the will of God by helping us change who we are. I'm going to give you all just a few minutes to do business with God, and I'm going to close it.
right up here. Just yield to it. value and says, look, I just want to do what Jesus taught. Lord, help us to focus on these one another's and realize this is a responsibility. Just like the song said that we sang, we know that one another is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to live out the one another's of the church, to love one another, to, to, to honor one another, to be patient with to build up one another. Lord, help us to aim at these things, to live in harmony, to be like-minded. Yes, even with our little disagreements. Lord, let us be wholehearted and like-minded on the majors so that we can make a big dent before your son returns. Father God, as we leave here today, I pray that you would keep these things in our hearts. That we would literally meditate on them all week long. Meditate on them. Meditate on them. Look for ways to assimilate them into our life. Look for ways to build each other up, to love each other, to serve one another, to be patient with one another. Lord, that this meeting today would not be in vain, but would move us in the direction of being the church that you have called us to be. A fully functional body of Christ devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Living in step with the Holy Spirit. Father God, take us to that place. In Jesus' name.